In today's video, we'll be exploring the clinical and diagnostic approach to diabetes, an important topic for your internal medicine exam. We will cover the essential steps in diagnosing diabetes, including patient history, physical examination, and key lab tests. At what age should screening for diabetes typically begin? The USPSTF recommends adults at 35 years of age to 75 years old with a BMI of at least 25 be screened for diabetes. Also, if the patient presents with symptoms of hyperglycemia, it is also appropriate to screen for diabetes. What are the common symptoms of diabetes? Common symptoms of diabetes include polydipsia, polyuria, weight loss, and blurry vision. Some physical findings, such as acanthosis nigricans, are also suggestive of diabetes. The diagnosis of diabetes can be made based on the following criteria. In patients who are symptomatic, a random blood glucose of more than 200 with hyperglycemic crisis or symptoms of hyperglycemia defined the diagnosis of diabetes. In patients who are asymptomatic, the following criteria must be met. A hemoglobin A1c of at least 6.5%, a fasting blood sugar of at least 126, or a 2-hour blood glucose level of more than 200 during a 75-gram oral glucose tolerance test. This test is primarily for pregnant women. Based on those criteria, two abnormal tests are required to confer the diagnosis in asymptomatic patients, and these tests can be drawn from the same or separate samples. If the two abnormal screening tests are discordant, the test that is above the diagnostic threshold should be repeated to confirm the diagnosis of diabetes. For instance, if the fasting plasma glucose is more than 126, with a hemoglobin A1c of more than 6.5%, then a diagnosis of diabetes is confirmed. However, if the fasting plasma glucose is 120 and the hemoglobin A1c is 6.8%, then there is a discordant, and the next best step is to repeat the abnormal result. In this case, order another hemoglobin A1c. A 42-year-old woman presents for health screening. She reports no symptoms and has no medical conditions. Her family history is significant for type 2 diabetes in her father. Her BMI is calculated at 27. On examination, her blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate are all within normal limits. Lab test reveals a hemoglobin A1c of 6.1% and a fasting plasma glucose of 130. Which of the following is the most appropriate diagnostic test to perform? No other test needed. Repeat fasting plasma glucose. Immediate initiation of metformin therapy. Or repeat hemoglobin A1c. The correct answer is B, repeat fasting plasma glucose. A repeat fasting plasma glucose measurement should be performed in this patient to confirm the diagnosis of diabetes. She was appropriately screened for diabetes since she is older than 35 years of age with a BMI of at least 25. Remember, in an asymptomatic patient, diabetes can be diagnosed by two abnormal results based on the following criteria, a hemoglobin A1c of at least 6.5%, a fasting plasma glucose of at least 126, or a two-hour plasma glucose of 200 or greater during an oral glucose tolerance test. The two abnormal test results can be from the same sample. Fasting plasma glucose and hemoglobin A1c drawn at the same time, or two separate samples. If the two tests drawn at the same time are discordant, such as in this patient, then the test that is higher than the diagnostic threshold should be repeated. The diagnosis of diabetes is made on the basis of the confirmatory screening test. For this reason, fasting plasma glucose should be rechecked for this patient. A repeat fasting plasma glucose of 126 or greater will then confirm the diagnosis of diabetes. A repeat hemoglobin A1c would be indicated if the initial hemoglobin A1c was higher than the diagnostic threshold of at least 6.5%, which is not the case in this situation. In the event of discordant testing, the abnormal test, which is the fasting plasma glucose, should be repeated according to the guidelines. How often should we screen for diabetes? In general, patients with risk factors would receive screening of at least three years. Patients with a history of prediabetes should be screened at least yearly, and those patients with marginal A1c may be screened as soon as three to six months. Let's talk about hemoglobin A1c since it is widely used as a screening test for diabetes. Hemoglobin A1c measures the amount of hemoglobin bound to glucose. 
with a low value indicating lower levels of glucose bound to hemoglobin, and a high value indicating more glucose attached to hemoglobin. Yet, in conditions affecting the lifespan of red blood cells, the hemoglobin A1c result may not accurately reflect hyperglycemia. This is known as A1c discrepancy. In conditions that have low RBC turnover, such as iron deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, and folate deficiency, there will be less erythropoiesis, leading to more old glycated RBCs, causing a falsely elevated hemoglobin A1c. In conditions that have rapid RBC turnover, such as hemolysis or blood loss from GI bleeding, RBC stays in circulation for a shorter amount of time, and therefore there will be a lower number of glucose attached to hemoglobin. The result will show a falsely low hemoglobin A1c. 35-year-old female with type 2 diabetes presents to your clinic. She assures you that she exercises 150 minutes a week and takes her metformin every day. Her recent A1c remains 7.5%. She also reports menorrhagia and fatigue. Her lab results show microcytic anemia, low ferritin, low serum iron, and a high TIBC, which and following is the most appropriate next step in managing this patient's condition. Increase the dosage of metformin, initiate insulin therapy, prescribe EPO, treat the underlying iron deficiency, or refer the patient to a hematologist for further evaluation. The correct answer is D, treat the underlying iron deficiency anemia. The patient's presentation with microcytic anemia, low ferritin, low serum iron, and a high TIBC suggest iron deficiency, likely secondary to menorrhagia. Iron deficiency anemia can lead to a falsely high hemoglobin A1c due to shortened red blood cell lifespan resulting in an A1c discrepancy. Treating the underlying iron deficiency anemia should help correct the discrepancy and improve glycemic control. Therefore, the most appropriate next step in management in this patient is to treat the iron deficiency anemia. Hyperglycemia damages blood cells and causes microvascular and macrovascular disease. What are the microvascular and macrovascular complications of diabetes? Diabetes damages the small vessels in the retina, kidney, and nerves. The manifestations of microvascular disease related to diabetes include diabetic retinopathy, which are caused by retinal neovascularization and can lead to blindness. Also, diabetic nephropathy, which causes chronic kidney disease with aminuria and can lead to renal failure. Diabetic neuropathy can manifest in many ways by affecting the peripheral nerves and autonomic nervous system, including the nerves supplying the GU and GI tracts. Peripheral neuropathy causes loss of feeling in feet, which can lead to undetected trauma, can lead to subsequent ulcers, and even amputation. Autonomic dysfunction or failure manifests as orthostatic hypotension, hypoglycemic unawareness, gastroparesis, and neurogenic bladder. Screening for microvascular complications are important. Retinopathy should be screened with yearly retinal exams. Nephropathy screened with yearly urine tests for albuminuria by order by ordering a random spot urine albumin and urine creatinine, with a number of more than 30 being significant. Yearly foot exams and monofilament tests is important to assess for development of peripheral neuropathy, and there are no recommendations for screening for autonomic neuropathy. Macrovascular complications involves the cerebral, coronary, and peripheral vasculature, leading to cerebrovascular disease such as ischemic strokes, coronary artery disease, and myocardial infarctions and peripheral arterial disease. Unlike microvascular complications, there is no recommendation for screening for macrovascular disease. The most important ways to reduce macrovascular complications includes starting patients on moderate intensity, statin, recommended for primary prevention of hyperlipidemia, controlling blood pressure, mostly BP goal of less than 130 over 80, and if the patient smokes, encourage tobacco cessation. Type 1 diabetes is characterized by insulin deficiency due to destruction of insulin-producing beta cells in the pancreas. This destruction can result from autoimmune processes, idiopathic causes, or acquired conditions such as pancreatectomy or pancreatitis. Immune-mediated type 1 or type 1a diabetes accounts for about 5-10% to of newly diagnosed diabetes cases. The mechanism of beta cell destruction is multifactorial, 
likely triggered by environmental factors in the individuals with genetic susceptibilities. Specific HLA alleles are strongly associated with type 1A diabetes. At diagnosis, one or more autoantibodies are typically present, targeting glutamic acid decarboxylase, GAD65, tyrosine phosphatase IA2 and IA2 beta, islet cells, and zinc transporters. Due to the availability of highly automated and widely accessible assays, GAD65 and IA2 and autoantibodies are recommended for initial testing in newly diagnosed type 1A diabetes. GAD65 antibodies have a high prevalence at diagnosis and may remain detectable for years. Patients with type 1 diabetes are at increased risk of other autoimmune disorders. These include celiac disease, thyroid, vitiligo, and autoimmune primary adrenal gland failure. Idiopathic type 1 diabetes, or type 1B, is characterized by variable insulin deficiency due to beta cell destruction without the presence of autoantibodies. Patients with type 1B diabetes may experience episodic diabetic ketoacidosis. Typically, individuals with type 1B diabetes have a strong family history of type 2 diabetes. An acquired type 1 diabetes involves beta cell destruction that can result from diseases affecting the pancreas or from the effects of drugs or infections. This type of diabetes may lead to impaired insulin production or secretion ultimately resulting in type 1 diabetes. Now let's discuss insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is characterized by the peripheral cell's ineffective use of insulin to process glucose and fatty acids. Blood glucose levels remain normal as long as the beta cell from the pancreas in can increase insulin production. Hyperglycemia occurs from a relative insulin deficiency when the pancreas can no longer produce enough insulin to overcome peripheral resistance. Obesity increases the risk of insulin resistance and predisposes patients to development of type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is defined as persistent hyperglycemia accompanied by insulin resistance or relative insulin deficiency. The pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes is multifactorial, influenced by both genetic and environmental factors. Type 2 diabetes is commonly present in the first-degree relatives of individuals diagnosed with or at high risk for the condition. Type 2 diabetes typically presents in adults, although the incidence is increasing among children and adolescents as the rates of ob obesity and overweight rise in these populations. Type 2 diabetes has a gradual onset with most affected individuals remaining asymptomatic for several years. Clinical manifestations of insulin resistance may be evident on physical examination before diagnosis. At the time of the diagnosis, patients may already have microvascular or macrovascular complications as discussed previously. Here are some high-yield concepts that you need to know for diabetes. Start screening for diabetes at 35 years old in a patient with a BMI of at least 25, or screen patients for diabetes if they present with hyperglycemic symptoms. Hyperglycemic symptoms include polydipsia, polyuria, weight loss, and blurry vision. If a patient has symptoms of hyperglycemia with a random blood glucose of more than 200, a diagnosis of diabetes is established. If a patient is asymptomatic, two abnormal tests are required to confirm the diagnosis of diabetes. For instance, a fasting blood glucose of 128 and a hemoglobin A1c of 6.8% confirms a diagnosis of diabetes. If the fasting plasma glucose is 120, but the A1c is 6.8%, then repeat the abnormal result. In this case, order another hemoglobin A1c, and if the repeat test remains more than 6.5%, then the patient has diabetes. Be careful in interpreting A1C since hemoglobin A1C may be falsely high or low depending on the RBC turnover. When the RBC turnover is low, such as those with iron deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, or folate deficiency, there are a disproportionate number of older glycosylated RBCs and the hemoglobin A1C will be falsely elevated. When the RBC turnover is high, such as with hemolysis or bleeding, hemoglobin A1c may be falsely low. 
In type 1 diabetes, the destruction of beta cells in the pancreas result from autoimmune, idiopathic, or acquired conditions. If you're suspecting type 1A diabetes, initial testing includes GAD65 and IA2 autoantibodies. Type 1B diabetes is related to beta cell destruction without the presence of these autoantibodies. Type 2 diabetes is due to persistent hyperglycemia accompanied by insulin resistance or relative insulin deficiency. Diabetes causes microvascular and macrovascular complications. The microvascular complications requires annual screening, and this includes retinopathy exam, neuropathy, and nephropathy exam. And microvascular complications are diseases that involve atherosclerotic disease such as CAD and stroke. Screen for microvascular complications yearly and prevent development with aggressive glycemic control. This sets the talk on clinical and diagnostic high-yield key points on diabetes. Thank you and good luck.